And uh, we want to welcome people who might be watching this Zoom video of the message on this February 14th, 2021. And welcome, and we're grateful that you're online with us watching this video and the message. And I'm finishing my series that I started six weeks ago called Beginnings. We're looking at the foundational stories in the books of Genesis and Exodus, the foundational stories that give the Judeo-Christian faiths uh, kind of the rock upon which a lot of the movement of God in the world and the history that God is working out in the lives of people uh, is based on. When we left off last week, we were looking at the Hebrew people's walk to freedom found in the book of Exodus. And if you remember, they had suffered 400 years of slavery at uh, the hands of the Egyptian pharaohs in particular. And they were the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, which we read about in the book of Genesis chapter 12. And now they're finally free under the leadership of a reluctant leader, Moses, they're making their trek into the desert. They've come through the Red Sea, and now they're wandering about, and they will wander about for 40 years in that desolate land. But even though it sounds like going from slavery into the freedom towards the promised land, which would be Israel ultimately, you'd think that would be an incredibly positive experience. Well, the truth is that the Hebrew people would be spending a lot of time in the wilderness, and at various points, it would not feel very good. You see, there's a large piece of land that separates Egypt from the land of Canaan, which is the promised land where we now have the states of Israel and Palestine. And they had to get through that land. And it was a time of testing and a time of, of working out what it was to be the Hebrew people and to be a people who ultimately would be a light to all the nations. In the desert, they would receive the Ten Commandments. They would build a, a portable worship tent called the Tabernacle, and they would have constructed the Ark of the Covenant where sacred objects would be placed in there. In that desert trek, they would be formed into a new community of faith where they would be tested by God, and in many ways, they would test God's patience. It is a period of transition, and it's in this land in between where God will forge them into a people he needed them to be for his greater work of having them be a light to all the nations. Now, the Exodus story can be seen as a metaphor for the tough transitions that we all face at various times in our lives. It might be a transition into retirement, which sounds great, but is, can, can be fraught with some challenges at different points. Some of you know firsthand the transition uh, after the death of a spouse. Or you might be facing a transition in your health or in seeing a loved one in declining health. It could be transitions we're feeling in the wider society in our church because of the global pandemic, which seems to have no real end in sight. In all these difficult transitions in our lives, we have to go through this middle space, this land in between. And God wants to use that space and that time of transition in order to help transform our lives as well. But like the Israelites, most of us really dislike the transition periods because they're tough. In these times, we often struggle with God and might be hard pressed to see how God might use those times to help us grow deeper spiritual lives and stronger character traits. I wanna read a passage of scripture in the message translation from the book of Exodus, and it's chapter 16. And uh, this is just a small portion of the conversations that was going on and the challenges that were facing the people in this desert trek, in this transition period. So remember, they've come through uh, the, the challenges of going through the Red Sea, the 10 plagues, as you might remember, from uh, the book of Exodus earlier chapters, and now they're wandering about in the desert. And there are probably a month into this trek. And it says, on the 15th day of the second month after they'd left Egypt, so it's two months in, the whole company of Israel moved on from Elam to the wilderness of Sin, which is between 
Elam, and Sinai. And the whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. And the Israelites said, why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You brought us out into the wilderness to starve us to death. The whole company of Israel complained. God said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread down from the skies for you. The people will go out and gather each day's ration. I'm going to test them to see if they'll live according to my teachings or not. And so on the sixth day, when they prepare what they've gathered, it will turn out to be twice as much as their daily rations. Now, Moses and Aaron told the people of Israel, this evening, you will know that it is God who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of God. Yes, he's listened to your complaints against him. Moses continued, since it will be God who gives you meat for your meal in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, it is God who will have listened to your complaints against him. Who are we in all of this? You haven't been complaining to us. You've been complaining to God. And so Moses instructed his brother Aaron, tell the whole company of Israel, come near to God. He's heard your complaints. And then Aaron gave out the instructions to the company of Israel. And it is what, and there it was, the glory of God visible in the cloud. If you remember, there was a cloud that kind of gave them direction during the daytime hours. Now, that evening, quail flew in and covered the camp in the morning. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all over the camp. And when the layer of dew had lifted, there on the wilderness ground was a fine flaky something Finest frost on the ground. And the Israelites took one look at it and said to one another, what is it? And the Hebrew is manna. They had no idea what it was. So Moses told them, it is the bread God has given you to eat. And these are God's instructions. Gather enough for each person, about two quarts per person. Gather enough for everyone in your tent. That's the story that we're going to focus on this morning as we're talking about transitions, this land in between, and the grumblings that go on in that period of time. That passage, Exodus 16, verse 2, it says that in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron and ultimately towards God. Now, in all fairness, like most political leaders, trying to satisfy a broad constituency of people in tough times, Moses and Aaron uh, took the brunt of a lot of complaining from the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people thought that the leadership might need to be changed because they were tired of the kind of staples that they were getting. And they were running out of food. And so they were tired. They were cranky. And... In the rearview mirror, Egypt was looking pretty good. Even though they were slaves, remember, they said, oh, we had lamb stew back there. We had enough bread to eat. And here in the desert, it looks like they're going to starve to death. You see, even though Egypt was a place of great suffering and hardship, it was also a land of plenty. There were lush green fields of grains and vegetables and so even though they were slaves in Egypt, they ate pretty well. So how does God deal with the people's complaints and grumblings? Well, he gives them this strange substance, which is called manna. And the Hebrew word manna actually means, what is it? That's kind of an interesting phrase. What is it? We've all said that sometimes over a dinner when maybe we were younger and we thought the spinach on the plate, we really didn't want to eat. And so we told our parents, what is this? Well, it's kind of complaining. And that's what the Hebrew people were doing. Now, you're probably thinking that that manna from heaven was kind of like frosted flakes and might have tasted a little bit like haggis. But in actual fact, it was a coriander seed like kind of consistency. And in Exodus 1631, it tells us, it was kind of like wafers and tasted a bit like honey. So it wasn't all that bad. And over the course of weeks and months, they keep getting manna in the morning and quail at night, as much as they can eat. 
But do you think that's going to satisfy them for very long? No, of course not. Because after a couple of weeks of this diet, now they're complaining once again. They're angry and bitter and weary of this steady diet of manna and quail. Perhaps you're thinking, hold on. You people are no longer slaves. You're free. You've got nothing to complain about. But just put yourself in their place. Can you imagine a steady diet like that? Several years back, I did a little bit of an experiment during the season of Lent, and I decided that I was going to uh, kind of, well, ration myself. And so I started only eating granola bars, kind of like this, and water. I I had to forego my morning coffee, my toast, my granola. I, I didn't have steak for dinner. I didn't have potatoes. I didn't have anything except for granola bars and water to see how long I could last. And, uh, and let me tell you, the first morning, it wasn't too bad. But by the afternoon, I was starting to get cranky. And by the evening, all I could think of was food, glorious food. You remember that song from Oliver? Oh, that's all I could think about. Now, just as an aside, if you're on a strict diet of granola bars, you start to realize that there are a whole lot of food commercials on television. And in, in this day and age, there's so many commercials on food delivery apps. And so you can get anything you want 24 seven. And here I am restricting myself to granola bars and water. Boy, I'm sure I wasn't pleasant to be with. Connie's got this puzzled look on her face. Yeah, well, it happened, honey. She's blocked it out of her memory. Now, when you go on that kind of diet, you first realize how much time we spend thinking about food, buying food, preparing food and eating food. It consumes a huge amount of our days, particularly in COVID-19, isn't that true? How many of us are baking more, eating more, gaining more weight? It happens. And even if you're a busy family and you eat on the run, it still takes 10 minutes to sit down and eat a meal. But let me tell you, these little bars, you can eat one in one minute, guaranteed. But at a certain point, you get very tired of granola bars and water. So when you hear the voices of complaint in the desert from these freed Hebrew slaves, you have to kind of step back and consider your own life. Just for example, can we have a show of hands? Those of you who over the last 10 months during COVID-19 crisis have complained about the isolation. Anyone? Okay, a few of you. I'm, I'm realizing some people didn't put their hands up, but I think they're probably fibbing. How about the lack of social interaction? Any of you complain that you can't go out and see your friends and family? Of course. The inability to get to go to church. Any of you complained or thought, oh, it's kind of a drag? Yeah, of course. You see, we're, we're really, you know, so pampered, aren't we? When you think about it here in the West, we live very, very good lives compared to so many others. And we are prone to the same weaknesses of those Israelites so long ago who were complaining in the desert. You see, we're capable one minute of praising God. We sang songs of praise, had prayers, thinking of all the goodness that God has put into our lives. We thank God for where we live, where we work, where we play and have so much freedom. We Praise God and thank him for the blessings and his life or his life given to us. But when life becomes tough or when we're experiencing greater challenges or we're going through a difficult transition, we find ourselves complaining, perhaps, at God and complaining about life. So how do you respond when you're in the land in between those transition places in your life? Now, maybe some of us become sarcastic or more sensitive. Maybe we get frustrated or depressed, or maybe we get just plain and simple angry. After a while, 
the spirit of complaining can take root in your heart. And we've seen that response to the tough COVID crisis across North America, where people, some people, you know, are really, really angry. Now, some people, of course, have a right perhaps to be more angry than we are. Maybe many people have lost a job. Maybe they're struggling with a, a new reality where their hours have been reduced. Maybe they're struggling now with the health problems related from COVID-19, or they've seen someone that they love who passed away because of it. And so there is some understandable anger and dismay as we are moving in this season. But let me say, in the desert places of our lives, one thing that can grow quite well is complaining. So is there something that maybe you're grumbling about today? That you might be silently angry at God? Now, you might think that complaining is just being part of the human race. But God takes it a bit more seriously than that because God, I think, sees this in part as a heart or a character issue. To God, the Israelites' complaints amount to a rejection of who he is. It's an indication maybe that they don't really trust him. There's a parallel account in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. And in this same period of wilderness transition, there's complaining. And here's what it says. You've rejected the Lord who's among you. And you've wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Now, of course, don't get me wrong. There is a difference between complaining and an honest expression of our feelings before God. We all understand that it's important to express our emotions in healthy ways. And certainly when life is difficult or we're facing greater challenges, God wants us to go to him, to tell him how we're feeling, to express our displeasure or our sadness, our grief, our confusion, our pain, maybe even our anger. Honesty with God is productive and can be healing. But when a spirit of complaining takes root in our lives because we feel that life really is unfair, then it can quickly fester and become like an open wound that never really heals. And sometimes it leaves us in a place where we turn away from God. When a spirit of complaining takes hold in our lives, it can quickly become like quicksand, sucking the very joy out of life. And all of us probably have been in a place like that. We know that, right? Where life is tough, where there is a transition and things are not easy anymore. And so life just seems to drag on and every day becomes the same and we feel the weight of it. Sometimes that's what happens. I understand that. When a spirit of complaining lodges in my heart, it can push out a spirit of thankfulness and then we can maybe find ourselves in a place where we don't really trust God anymore. We don't feel that God really loves us anymore. Maybe we feel that God doesn't hear our prayers, isn't speaking to us. I've been in a place like that before. I'm sure you have maybe as well. And if I fail to respond to the goodness of God in my life, to his grace that is always free and abundant, then I'm much like the Israelites in the wilderness transition. The land in between is where we're confronted by the deep problems of life. But it can also be a place where God can do some of God's greatest work in our lives, where God can help us to grow and trust him more and where our character actually can get deeper. In Paul's letter to the people in the small church in Rome, at chapter five, verses one through five, there's a particular verse that I wanna pull out. And he says, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now, it's not easy to be a Paul and to rejoice in our sufferings. 
most of us are not going to find ourselves ever at that place where we're rejoicing that things are going badly in our life. But Paul experienced a great deal of suffering, and he's writing this probably when he was in prison. So he does have some experience of what it is like to suffer, but he's found these internal resources given to him by God that enable him to move above the suffering to find something of great value and and producing things in his life that maybe he was surprised that were coming about. Perseverance, which he says ultimately brings us hope, which really is about trusting God in every situation. And he has this very last sentence. He says, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You know, I can go through incredible trials when I know I'm surrounded by people who really love me. You know what that's like as well, I hope. When I know that I'm supported and taken care of emotionally by the warmth and love of people around me and by the warmth and love and presence of God's Holy Spirit in my life, then I experience a greater sense of hope and of healing and of the strength to move through those times of challenge and difficulty, believing that God is with me and that given time, God can produce good things even out of the suffering and even out of the tough transitions that maybe I'm facing right now. Now, those character traits that Paul talks about, you know, per perseverance, hope, uh, and you know, the strengthening of our own character, inner being, don't come by magic or by accident. It happens, however, when we do our part to place ourselves at the intersection of God's presence through various things that we can do, through our worship. So I hope that in our times when we worship, if you're struggling or feeling depressed or feeling your hope fading away, that these opportunities together give you a little bit more hope and courage to keep moving forward. It happens when we are going to God in prayer regularly so that we can share what we're really facing with God openly and honestly and be open to God's presence to give us encouragement or help or healing. When we read the scriptures, we're engaged with other people, maybe in a Bible study. Those things have been foundational for Christians for thousands of years and for the Hebrew people for more than that period of time, to get through the desert periods, the transition periods, the struggles, the pain, the heartbreaks in their lives and in the life of those peoples in those communities of faith. They got through those because they did those spiritual disciplines and they were able to trust God and God brought them out of the desert times, out of the suffering, out of those difficult transition periods into a time of hope and greater freedom and grace. And when God is present with me, my hope gets restored and I can get through nearly anything. And that, that's when I get to refocus my energy and thoughts to be reminded of how truly blessed I am. And then I find that my focus starts to shift from my problems and complaints to the needs of other people around me. That's when my thoughts move from myself and the challenges that I'm facing, and I focus on other people, and I see what they're going through. And it gives me some perspective, but it also gives me a reason to pray for them and to be more compassionate for other people who are going through difficult times in their lives. It helps us to gain a sense of empathy. You know, one of the greatest gifts of love that I think we see Jesus demonstrate in his life and ministry is that he met all sorts of people in so many places of brokenness and pain and depression and sadness. And he always came to them at their place of greatest need. And he showed them the love of God through a healing touch, through a word of encouragement, through a gift of grace and forgiveness, or through his healing power. And all of those examples of what Jesus did to express the love of God to individuals can be our experience as well. When we understand that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us, even when we're at our worst, even when we're complaining, 
even when we feel that life is unfair, if we start to remember, oh no, I remember, God is always with me. His Holy Spirit's presence is with me. Jesus' love and grace will never leave me. That enables me to focus a little less on my complaints, on my challenges, so that I can see that there are other people around who may have even greater challenges than I have. And I can perhaps be a person who can help them. I can be the person who can give them hope. I can be the person who can help them move through a transition period that's causing them great pain because I've gone through it and I know that I'm coming out the other side because God loves me, God's presence is with me. And as I pray and as I worship and as I think about the scripture passages, I'm encouraged and I'm renewed in my faith and I begin to get a stronger heart and a stronger faith, even in a time of transition and suffering. I think God has a great deal to teach us in these in between times, the transition periods in our lives, in those places where we struggle oftentimes the most. In the land between, a, far, a, a remarkable phenomenon can occur. We have the opportunity to grow a more vibrant, vital faith that allows us to be at our best when life is at its worst. We have the potential to emerge from a season of profound disappointment, perhaps even chaos, with a faith faith that is stronger than ever, and to grow our character during the process. In the land in between, we have the possibility to grow in our trust in God as we journey through life. And we might even discover on the other side of the desert that God has produced the fruit in our lives that actually makes us a blessing to the people around us and to the communities that we're a part of. So may God give you hope and healing and strength and perseverance during this transition period in all of our lives, certainly in your life and my life, I know. Amen. God, I thank you that you are with us in this season of great challenge and struggle. I mean, I think that for the most part, most of us have had a pretty easy ride of things. We have enough food in our fridges. We live in warm houses. Many of us have good jobs, pension checks, income that come in that enable us to enjoy life even in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. We very much are the fortunate ones when so many others are going through serious, serious challenges. So help us to ease off on the complaining and to step into the possibilities that you want to grow our characters, that you want to help us to come out on the other side of the COVID-19 crisis as people of greater faith and courage, so that when that time comes, that we can still be, in actual fact, a people who bring light and hope and healing to the communities and people around us. Ultimately, you want to do those things in our lives so that we can bless other people. So we thank you for the transition, for your Holy Spirit's presence with us, for the gifts that you have blessed us with, as well as the gift of worship and praise and prayer and scriptures. May those give us nourishment to see this season through. And when we come out on the other side, we're going to be stronger than ever. Thanks to you. Amen. I'm going to go to share the screen and we will stop the recording.